Welcome everybody to the talk uh, about applied category theory by Johannes Drever. Um, now, some people might consider applied category theory a contradiction in terms, but he's going to show us that that isn't the case, but rather it's an interesting subject. So before we start, uh, two remarks. Um, there's a YouTube stream, and if you're here in the Zoom meeting and don't want to appear on YouTube, please um, mute yourself and um, disable your camera. If you're in, on the YouTube live stream, then please note that there's um, a Zoom meeting which you can join and a Slack channel. And you can ask questions in both the Zoom meeting and the Slack channel, and I will read out um, the questions on the Slack channel. And yes, you can ask questions and anytime. And without further ado, Johannes. Hi, uh, I'm Johannes. I'm a software developer. And uh, yeah, I, I got into Haskell because I think it's a beautiful language. And uh, I'm kind of interested in theory. That's why I will uh, talk about applied category theory. So uh, applied category theory is a very uh, interesting uh, field of research right now. So there are a lot of activities going on uh, and uh, a lot of applications actually of uh, category theory. Uh, one of these applications is algebraic databases. And uh, my talk will mostly focus on algebraic databases. So uh, if you program in Haskell and if you start learning Haskell, basically you will encounter a lot of uh, concepts from category theory. So uh, you will uh, encounter functors and monads um, and maybe uh, lenses. And um, <clears throat> this makes learning Haskell at the beginning a bit difficult because these concepts are very unfamiliar. And uh, one reason for this is that these concepts stem from uh, category theory actually. So, the idea is maybe uh, to look at category theory directly to get a better intuition of how these concepts work. Um, so category theory is, uh, uh, of course, it is uh, located in pure mass or it started there, but it is also an interdisciplinary subject. Um, so there's been a paper uh, by John Bias on physics, topology, logic and computation. So this already uh, embraces um, different disciplines. Um, you may have heard of the uh, Curry-Howard correspondence. The Curry-Howard correspondence uh, is between uh, logic and computation. So uh, if you look at this table, uh, you see that there are two columns, logic and computation. The basic idea is that in logic, you have propositions and proofs and uh, in computation, you have data types and programs, and these are uh, corresponding in some sense. And uh, there are even more columns to this table, for example, physics, where you have systems and processes, and topology, where you have manifolds and corporisms. Uh, and also there's a, a column called category theory, and there you have like a very abstract uh, representation of things. So basically you just have objects, and morphisms. And so for, there is no semantics uh, um, applied to these things. And um, so the, the, the promise, or for me at least, uh, in category theory is that um, if, if you go to this abstract level um, and, and just uh, develop theories on this abstract level, that uh, you can build up a strong theory and use the theory in many different fields. And maybe uh, you can uh, understand things more easily in different fields. For example, if you have a strong background in computation, uh, then you may find logic uh, more accessible um, because you can transfer your intuitions. So today I will uh, talk about categorical databases. Um, so why is, uh, is it interesting to look at databases uh, from a categorical standpoint? The first thing is if you are familiar with category theory, uh, then you have a conceptual clear language and tool set which you can use 
to reason about databases. And uh, it can also serve as a didactic device if you have no understanding of category theory, uh, but you have some intuition uh, on databases. You may uh, relate your intuitions of databases to categorical concepts. And uh, further, there's also um, an implementation of this whole idea. So you may even uh, use this implementation uh, in database projects. So um, <clears throat> if you open a book on category theory um, and look at the table of contents, you will uh, see uh, some um, topics discussed. The first one is categories obviously, uh, then there are functors, um, and then there are also natural transformations. Um, actually, natural transformations is a central concept in category theory. Um, so actually, historically, category theory has been developed to uh, make the notion of natural transformations, like an intuitive notion, uh, precise and, and formalize it. And the concepts of categories and functors um, arose in this process. Unfortunately, I will not have time to talk about natural transformations, um, but I will cover the other two topics. I will talk about adjunctions because adjunctions are interesting in this whole database story. Um, and there's a, um, another topic, which is universal constructions, which is also very central to uh, category theory, but I won't cover them also. So let's dive right into the formal definition of categories. Um, a category is um, specified by a collection of objects. And uh, for two objects or for all, every two objects in a category, there is uh, a set of morphisms. So the set of morphisms uh, tells you how these two objects may be related. And for each object, there is a specific morphism called the identity morphism, which goes from the object C back to the object C. So it's kind of like a loop. Further, there's a composition of morphisms. So if you have one morphism F from object C to D and another morphism G from object D to E, then you can compose these morphisms to uh, a morphism F and then G, which goes from C to E. Um, alternatively, like in, in math, normally you have function composition, which is the other way around. So you would say G after F. Um, basically, yeah, this um, is reading from right to left. Um, but so the composition uh, F and then G is a little bit more uh, easier to follow. Okay, so we, we have like the, the, the things in our category defined. Now we, uh, um, the, the things has to satisfy certain conditions. First, uh, the composition with the identity morphism uh, has to be unital. That means if you first uh, go around the identity on C and then go around F, then it's the same as just going around F. And if you, first go around F and then the identity around D. It's also the same as just going around F. The second condition is that morphisms have to be associative. So if you have um, three morphisms from F from A to B and G from B to C, uh, and the third one H from C to D, then the following has to be equal. If you first compose F then G and then H, it's the same as first using F and then composing G and H. Okay, so let's uh, look at some examples of categories. Since we are at a um, Haskell hackathon, uh, we talk about Haskell. So uh, Haskell in Hask, the objects are types, uh, for example, void or unit uh, or simple data types such as int. 
or also uh, composite types, for example, the products of two integers, uh, the pair, or um, a maybe integer, which is some type, uh, or a list of integers. The morphisms in Hask are uh, functions. So for example, there's a function plus two, which goes from integer to integer. So it kind of loops around integer. Then there's the function odd, which is between two types, the integers and bools. And then there are functions like map, uh, which takes a function from A to B and returns a function from list of A to list of B. Um, since we want to have a category, we need an identity morphism that we do have in Haskell. So it's just the identity function. And we need a composition. Um, the composition, no, sorry. So the composition uh, is a flip of function composition, uh, which is uh, also the composition which may be read from left to right. Okay, further examples of categories. Um, so we just saw Hask, and there's a technicality. So Hask is not actually a category because there's undefined in there, but it's uh, kind of uh, okay to gloss over that. Um, then there's the category of sets, where the sets are objects and the functions are morphisms. There's the category of vector spaces over a field where the vector spaces are the objects and the linear maps between the vector spaces are the morphisms. There's the, list, the category of groups, where the groups are the objects and the group homomorphisms are the morphisms in the category. And there's a category of categories, where the objects are small categories and the morphisms are functors. So the, the categories we saw right now are all very complicated. For example, in Hesp, it's possible to have a maybe int or a maybe, maybe int or a maybe, maybe, maybe int and so on and so forth. So um, it's hard to visualize or for example, to draw these on a blackboard. Um, fortunately, there are much simpler categories in a certain sense. For example, a monoid may be seen as a category. So um, the questions you should ask uh, if you look at a category is first, what are the objects in the category? And you see that there's only one single dot, uh, which is the single object in this category. Basically, this is the set with 0, 1, and 2. Then there are three morphisms, um, plus 0, plus 1, and plus 2. And uh, these are the morphisms of the category. And plus zero is the identity morphism. And further, it's possible to compose morphisms. So all this is uh, module three. So you can say plus one and then plus two, uh, which is uh, plus three, which would be plus one. Okay, so um, we saw a simple category and uh, actually it's possible to construct uh, finite uh, um, categories from a graph. This is called the free construction on a graph. Um, and basically it uh, works as follows. You take a graph and then you interpret each node of the graph as an object of the, of the category. You interpret each edge of the graph as a morphism in the category. And you add the identity morphisms, which are needed in order to uh, be a category. And finally, you add the transitive morphisms, which is the parallel morphism uh, in red here. And also, since there is a loop uh, between the lower two nodes, uh, all the compositions of these nodes have to be added. So actually this uh, category would have infinitely many uh, uh, morphisms. 
So the, the basic idea is that you kind of switch the vocabulary. You have a graph with nodes and patches, and uh, you interpret this graph as a category and say, okay, these are the objects and these are the morphisms. And you have to construct all the missing structure. So now we can uh, have finite presentations of three categories. So we can just take any graph and interpret this graph as a category. So the graph on the left is just a graph with one node. So I listed the morphisms as a set below the graph. Um, the morphisms in this category is just the identity morphism A. Uh, the middle graph, there are three objects. So there are three identity morphisms and two uh, morphisms F and G. And the graph on the left, right, there are four morphisms uh, for objects and those four identity morphisms. And the four morphisms F, G, uh, H, and I. And also the compositions of F, then H, and G, then I. So we have 10 morphisms here. Further, it's uh, possible to constrain um three categories uh, with uh, with um, equations so paths may be uh, equated if they have the same source and uh, same target vertex um, and then the resulting morphisms uh, so if you look at the set of resulting morphisms there are only nine morphisms here uh, because f then g is the same as H than I. So we just have to write one morphism. OK, so we uh, have the basic definition of category and saw some examples. Um, now I want to start to explain how database schemas may be interpreted as a category. Um, so this graph, if you look at it as a category, um, may represent a database schema. The basic idea is that the tables are the objects of the category. So this has like two objects, uh, three objects, the employee and the department, and also uh, the, the string. Uh, so the idea with string is, uh, which may be a bit unfamiliar if you are used to normal database schemas, is that string is like an infinite table where all the possible strings are written into. So the primary keys are the identity errors on the objects, which are not shown here. Um, and the, the columns are actually morphisms between objects. So for example, there's uh, the employee, uh, and the employee has a column first name and last name, which are just strings, and also has a column works in, uh, which is a foreign key to the department. Um, yeah, and actually foreign key paths. So if you join multiple tables, uh, they are just compositions of morphisms. So in this formalism, it's also possible to, uh, to express data constraints um, as path equations. So for example, um, if you have a department uh, and a secretary, uh, they should work in the same department as she's the secretary of. And the uh, manager of the employee should also work in the same, uh, in the same department as the employee. All right, so far so good. Um, this is uh, the basic idea how uh, categories may be interpreted as schemas is clear, I hope. Uh, now we want to start uh, to relate different database schemas. Um, because like the, the, the goal is to have um, transformations between database uh, instances. So to do data migration and uh, functors actually um, are able to express relations between databases. So the formal definition of a functor is that if you have two categories, C and D, 
then a functor from C to D is specified first by mapping all the objects. So each object in C is mapped to an object in D. And then also by mapping the uh, morphisms. So in Haskell, you often talk about lifting morphisms. Um, so like a, a morphism in the category C from C1 to C2 uh, is lifted via F of F to a morphism uh, in the category D. And also the functor has to obey certain properties. Um, first, the identity morphism in C uh, when lifted has to be the identity morphism on the object in D. And further, the composition of morphisms in C uh, has to be the same as first lifting the two morphisms and then composing them in D. So let's look at simple examples of functors. Um, these are categories two and three. So the idea of this number categories is that the number tells the number of objects in the category. And uh, then you have morphisms between each consecutive uh, object in the category. And of course, also you have the uh, transitive morphisms. Um, yeah, so here are, uh, so this is the category two and this is the category three, uh, the functor first maps the objects. Um, so if you map the first object of two to the first object of the category three, um, then you may choose the uh, second object uh, and may map it to the second object in three as shown in this example. Or you may also map it to the first object or to the third object. And if you map it as shown in this example to the second object, then the mapping of the morphism is trivial because it has to be, there's only one possibility for this morphism. So in the second example, you see that the first object is mapped to the third object in the category three. Um, in this case, the, um, there are no options to choose the second object. So if you would map it, for example, to the first object in three, uh, then there would be no morphism from the third object to the first object. Um, so this won't work. And uh, the third example is um, if you map the first object to the first object in the category three and the second object to the third object in the category three, then the morphism is mapped to the function uh, composition uh, in the category three. So functors in Haskell, I think, uh, I, I suspect as everybody has uh, seen the functor in Haskell is defined by a type class and basically it just defines one function called map and map lifts functions from A to B to functions f of A to f of B. Oh, sorry, it's the type of, so it should be f of b. Um, the implementation has to avoid the functor laws. Um, so mapping the identity uh, doesn't change anything and mapping the composed morphism is the same as first mapping the first morphism and then mapping the second morphism. And here's an example of an instance functor, which is the list functor. All right, so um, now we want to use the functors. How, how can functors be used in a categorical setting? Uh, and the idea is that uh, functors may uh, be instances of databases. Um, so how does it work? Um, if you look at a single column table, then this table may be interpreted as a set, right? So we have example sets like programming languages with the final set or uh, prime numbers, which is an infinite set, or it may be even the empty set. So um, now we define a functor from a very specific category, which is a category one. Uh, the category one has just one object and an identity morphism. Um, so there are not many choices. Um, 
So basically, what, how does a functor from the category one to set look like? Um, what it does is that it just selects exactly one set. Right? So it may, for example, select this table, like the data of this table. That's, that's the basic idea. So a functor from one to set is a database instance of a database with just one table. Okay, so we want to have tables uh, with, or database schemas with more than one table, obviously. Um, when we are talking about functors from C to Z, so we have to ask, okay, uh, how are the morphisms from our category C, which describes the database schema, mapped to Z? So uh, what is the structure there? The answer is that it's, uh, the functions in set, because functions are morphisms in set. And uh, a function uh, may just be tabulated, uh, or like if the sets are finite, can be just written as a table. So here in this example, uh, the foreign key written by of the books is uh, mapped to a function, which is represented by this table. So just for the um, syntax, like you say C instance, like the instance of C uh, from any category C to set, this functor uh, may be used to define a database instance uh, on a category C or on a schema defined by a category C. Um, sorry to interrupt, yeah. there's a question on the Slack channel, um, mm -hmm. which is, with less rosy glasses, shouldn't the target of the functor be in some way real connected to the programming language one is working in? Okay. Um, so the question is like the, yeah, so we are uh, taking the data, um, the, the target category is set. Um, should it be related to the programming language? Um, yeah, I think so. This is more on the mathematical side, on the abstract side, where you talk about like, um, yeah, if, if you talk about, I think all the database theory, uh, you talk about relations and subsets and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, basically, um, this theory tries to model uh, databases, right? And um, and I, yeah, I think there's a good point in there that. Uh, of course, you would kind of like to relate uh, your data directly to types. And uh, actually, um, there are possibilities to do that. Um, but first of all, uh, it's easier to think of database instances as just in terms of sets. OK, so, so now I hope you have some idea how a database instances may be uh, viewed as uh, functors from a category describing a schema to set. Um, now we want to talk about mappings between database schemas. Uh, so what you see here is like a code listing of uh, CQL, which is a categorical query language. Um, and in CQL, you may define um, database schemas. So you see two schemas, one called S for source, which has two tables uh, and one and two. And the two tables have, um, so N1 does have two attributes, name and salary, and N2 has one attribute, H. And then you see the schema T for target, uh, which just has one single table and all this table has all the three attributes. And then you can define a mapping, which is a mapping between S and T. And for this mapping, you have to define for each entity uh, how it is mapped. So N1 is mapped obviously to N. So there's only one table where we can map it to. And the attributes uh, of um, N1 are mapped to the attributes of the table. And for the entity N2, 
uh, it's also mapped to the table n and the attribute h is mapped to the attribute h of the table n. So the functor f from s to t maps between two categories. Oh, okay. Um, so um, now we want to take talk about data migrations. We have seen uh, how um, how basically um, how database schemas may be related with the mapping, uh, and we have a database instance. Uh, from T to set and the schema mapping from source to target. And now we just may pre-compose the functor F and uh, we pre-compose it to the instant functor. And uh, the resulting functor is called delta F is a functor from S to set. And functor from S to set, as we have seen, is a functor uh, on uh, is, is, a, is an instance of a database. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's have a look at an example. Um, here are the two tables uh, or the two database schemas we just saw. The first one with two tables, the second one with one table, and the functor f mapping between these two database tables, uh, database schemas. And uh, the functor F is a pullback functor. So that means that it takes the data in the table N and uh, basically copies the corresponding data uh, to the tables N1 and N2. And uh, what like the identity columns in N1 and N2, they have IDs and these are duplicated. Okay, so, um, so far we have seen functors as mapping between database schemas and also as uh, database instances. And further uh, functors may um, migrate data between data instances. Um, now I will talk about junction because um, the junctions are interesting for um, data migrations uh, because they give rise to data migrations. So I will just give a very short introduction to the junctions. So basically, if you have two categories, C and D, um, then there may be two functors between these two categories. And uh, these functors are a joint, or maybe are in some relationship. Uh, so first of all, um, let's talk about a notion of equality between two categories C and D. Uh, so a category C and D, uh, if there are two functors between them uh, and you can like go from C via L to D and then back via R to C, if like this functor is the same as the identity functor, uh, then these categories are equal. But you can also weaken this notion and uh, relate the two functors uh, in a specific way. And this is the natural transformation. So uh, what does a natural transformation do? It is a mapping between two functors such that certain coherence conditions hold. So uh, if you have the functor first R and then L, which goes from D to D, and there's a natural transformation from this functor to the identity functor on D, and 
the same is the other way around. So like there's a natural transformation from the identity functor on C to uh, a functor going from L to R, um, then these categories are uh, in a certain relation and the two functors are adjoined to each other. So the functor L is the left adjoint to R and R is the right adjoint to L. Let's talk about some examples of adjunctions. So we already saw um, something like that. We saw the free construction on graphs and uh, free constructions are often um, parts of adjunctions. So there are, so the first thing you can do is to take some structure and uh, map it to another structure by constructing all uh, the data you need for it. And uh, then there's like the other direction where you can just say, okay, I um, yeah, let's maybe stick to the example with, with the graph and categories. If you have a graph and then you do the free construction and get a category, um, then you can also look at the category and just look at it as a graph. So you kind of just switch the vocabulary. So you said, like, look at the category and instead of saying, okay, these are the objects, you say, okay, these are the nodes. And instead of saying these are morphisms, you say these are vertices. So um, the functor uh, U is right adjoint, the forgetful functor is right adjoined to F, and F is left adjoined to the functor U. And basically, uh, you write this uh, with this turn style symbol, and the turn style symbol always points to the left adjoined function. Further example of junctions. Um, yeah, you, you know uh, currying. So currying uh, basically is, uh, is a higher order function. Uh, you can have a function which takes a pair of A, B and returns a C and curry this function, which means that you get a function which takes an A and then partially applies it and gets the function from B to C. And with uncurry, you can do it the other way around. Um, and the, what you see above is basically the notation, the home set notation of an function. Um, basically, you have an object A times B in, and an object C. And uh, the, this set means that it's the set of all morphisms between A times B and C. And so this set is isomorphic to the set of all morphisms between A and B to the power of C. So you may have seen this notation B to the power of C because it's basically uh, all the functions from C to B. So, um, Okay, we, we have seen the pullback functor, right, on the slides before, um, where you can pull back the data along this functor and like fill in the data in, in this schema uh, via the mapping. And there are also two push forward functors. And these functors arise as a junction of this functor delta f. So there's the right adjoint, which is uh, the functor pi of f and uh, pi of f um, is kind of a Cartesian product. Um, so it yeah, does a product of all these um, values. And uh, the, yeah, then there's also the left adjoint, uh, which is um, this functor sigma f. And the left adjoint is uh, a union of these two tables. Um, so it copies the data here and inserts uh, labeled null values. 
So, yeah, actually, uh, I was expecting to to be, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I'm actually up on my last last slide already. Um, so if you have, do you have questions? There are currently no questions on the Slack channel. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe anything, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, we are going towards the end now. Um, the references, so what I talked about um, is basically um, what is uh, in the third chapter of seven sketches. In compositionality, um, written by the Brennan Fong and David Spivak. And um, yeah, so there's the whole story, and also there are uh, papers going deeper into the story of functorial data migration, um, both on the theoretical side and on the practical implementation. So um, yeah, applied category theory, um, historically category theory um, yeah, was developed in, in the 1940s by, uh, by Eilenberg, Berg and McLean. Um, actually, they were um, developing this, this theory uh, in order to integrate um, algebra and geometry. And um, so, yeah, there's a long history of applications uh, of category theory in pure math. And I think nowadays most of the concurrent mathematic uh, uses category theory in uh, some way. So category theory has always been applied. Um, it is applied in databases and knowledge representation. This was the topic I covered today. Um, so, yeah, first you, you can have uh, database instances, database schemas, and uh, get database migrations um, from this formalism. And you can also uh, extend this to, um, by using um, constructions from category theory. There's this thing called the Gordon deconstruction. Um, and this can be used to transform knowledge representations uh, to um, the sub, um, subject, verb, object language, actually. Uh, category theory is applied in functional programming. So, um, yeah, monads uh, have been developed in, um, in category theory, just on a theoretical uh, side, and uh, Orgino Moggi uh, just observed that it's possible to, to explain uh, effects and uh, lists and uh, so on and so forth in uh, terms of category theory. And uh, this has been imported into functional programming and uh, there has been like an exchange of ideas from functional programming or from category theory to functional programming for a long time. Um, there's one question on the Slack. Um, mm -hmm. How do you represent the uh, practical, in quotation marks, parts of relational databases? So for example, indices and constraints. Okay, um, so, um, so, are uh, indices, okay. Um, yeah, so basically this is um, whole idea. So CQL is, is a tool which has an implementation. There's a Java implementation uh, where you can define schemas and mappings and do really database migration. Um, 
and you can define constraints in CQL. Um, I don't know in, so basically what they do is that they translate uh, um, yeah, the categorical uh, representation to SQL statements. So it has to run on some kind of engine and one engine would be uh, SQL. And I don't know if there are other backends. Um, yeah. And then if you need indices, yeah, you maybe, I don't know if there's a specific uh, notation for indices and uh, the stuff in CQL. I guess you could consider indices as uh, out of scope because indices don't, um, um, not not part of the semantics of queries, but just make things faster. Is yeah, that's that true. Case? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, this is like, yeah. Okay, so uh, CQL started basically uh, from, from a theoretical perspective. And uh, basically the idea is to, to like use the theoretical ideas to get a clean vocabulary uh, of database transformations and then derive implementations from these uh, yeah, clean vocabularies. And uh, of course, then there's a, a lot of work to um, yeah, implement this in, uh, in an efficient manner. And actually, yeah, this work is still ongoing. Um, I think like the implementation started at around uh, 2015 and uh, Right now, I'm not really sure how the status today is, um, but uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of work going on in this direction. All right, um, so further applications of category theory. Um, so there, there are Petri networks uh, in chemical reaction networks. So the basic idea is that um, chemical processes may be modeled by Petri networks and uh, these may be uh, described by category theory. There are quantum processes uh, which are also possible to be described in terms of category theory. I think the, um, there are something uh, called string diagrams pops up there. Um, so string diagrams uh, is a specific representation of categories. So uh, what you write, like uh, draw the objects as points and the morphisms as, uh, as arrows, but do it the other way around. So basically the arrows are boxes and the morphisms are uh, kind of connecting lines. And uh, so this, um, these string diagrams may be used to describe quantum processes. And interestingly, the same uh, formalism may be used uh, for natural language processing. Then there is uh, open games and game theory, um, which may also be uh, represented by uh, string diagrams and in open games and game theory lenses pop up a lot. So there's uh, um, Yeah, in, in this uh, research um, Lenses are kind of a way to relate two different structures in, in a, a Coherent fashion and they pop up on uh, different locations. For example, in databases and knowledge representations, there is some newer work where also lenses play a certain role. And uh, in game theory, they are also important. And uh, last but not least, uh, in machine learning, um, there's a paper called Backprop as a Functor. So um, their lenses also play a central role. Okay, so applied category theory is uh, an interesting research area, which is uh, 
buzzing and there's a lot of interesting things are going on. There's a journal uh, called Compositionality. So Compositionality is an archive overlay journal, um, which basically means that papers are published on archive and then are curated uh, for the Compositionality journal. It's quite new. There have been, I think, like five or six publications so far, and there are uh, hopefully many interesting publications uh, coming along. Um, there is an applied category theory conference uh, held each year. And uh, at this conference, um, all the topics are hinted at uh, are presented. And there, so these are more or less all uh, like coming from a developer's perspective. All, all the talks are very um, theoretical. And the methods are um, are developed on a theoretical level, um, but there are also applications. So, uh, for example, there's an industry track um, where they invite speakers from the industry uh, that uh, that uh, give experience reports on on uh, applications uh, of category theory. Um, returning to the question about um, indices, um, there's mm -hmm. a suggestion on the Slack channel, um, and the suggestion is um, to maybe uh, tag morphisms as injective as a hint to populate an index in the background for the reverse lookup, lookup and enforced injectiveness. The morphisms and... So I, I think the proposal is that you have two tables um, and have a morphism between them that is labeled as injective. And so the source table would be representing the index and the target table, the table that you want to have an index of. Okay. Ah, okay. And yeah. I think that might work. So the, yeah, this could work that you basically um, place implementation details into the framework and specify an index by that method, yeah. Um, so I've got another question. So I'm a programmer um, who deals with an application which has a database with a lot of tables and um, how might a tool like CQL help me in my day job? Yeah, um, I think um, so. Yeah, so I think the the, the most benefit, uh, the, the biggest benefit would be to have uh, an explicit representation of the databases. So um, and also also relations. So uh, I think like in, in your day-to-day -day work, um, there are a lot of different domains uh, which are kind of similar. So there's one customer who has a database uh, um, where a specific domain is described and then there uh, is another system which kind of describes the similar domain, but uh, things are a bit different. So you have to map between these two domains. And so if you, think about this on a grander scale, for example, in medicine, where you have uh, yeah, many, um, many hospitals who have kind of like the same database schema and this data is to be merged, uh, then you maybe could think about uh, a standard or uh, to integrate all these, um, all these uh, databases. But, but then again, maybe at some point in time, uh, like, the, like the industry, for medicine uh, wants to uh, integrate the data with the hospital data, whatever. So then uh, you, you already, maybe you have the same data in these two domains and then you again have to merge it. So it's a good idea to focus on, on uh, transformations between data. And, and that's what uh, CQL does is kind of to place transformations of data first 
and uh, to describe the, the mappings between data. And then the idea is, at least is that all the data migration code doesn't have to be written by hand and all the migration logic, but uh, it kind of derives from the theory. And then you also may define some integrity constraints on your database schema um, via these parse equations I showed. And uh, then you kind of get a compile time check. So if, for example, if you do an ETL, like an extract transform load process, then you often like have messy data coming from a customer and you have to put it into another format. And uh, there is already an ETL process doing that. Um, and then like new data comes in uh, and you have to, to do the ETL process again. And this may take uh, a long time. And uh, yeah, if the, there are some constraints violated in the data, you will only uh, like see it after running everything basically. And yeah, with the database uh, path equations, uh, formalism, you can put some constraints on the data. There's one more question in the Slack. Mm -hmm. How do the path constraints fare in bigger systems? It seems you'd have to solve the word problem for a large monoid. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, actually, I don't know. So I haven't uh, worked with the implementation. I, I just uh, played around with some implementation and didn't really uh, have the chance to apply it in a, in a bigger project. Um, so, yeah, I guess that, uh, that it depends on the implementation. Yeah. Yeah, certainly interesting. Yeah. How they did that. Yeah, I think um, that that um, there are yeah that there are a lot of chances to uh, to have data migration tools. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think like the overall story of applied category theory is very, um, so like database migration is just one example of uh, applied category theory. So um, yeah, like if you use this categorical uh, formalism, maybe you can integrate it in uh, other fields. So for example, uh, they started to integrate uh, type systems, uh, with the databases, so if your if your type system is also a category, and uh, your your database schemas are um, modeled as categories, then you kind of can speak in the same language about uh, them. And maybe so I think like a big problem in uh, programming, like with databases and working on this, is often that you uh, have a boundary between like the database and the application. And uh, yeah, most of the time, maybe SQL, for example, and the application logic. And uh, you have to write code to translate between these two domains. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, if you model everything in category theory, you will have an easier job to integrate the two domains between these boundaries. Yeah, yeah so. Um, um, so, um, um, so if this is the end of your uh, talk, I will ask everybody to unmute. So we can thank Johannes. Thank you. Dan. Great. Thank you. I think if you have further <laughs> questions, um, you can ask them in the Slack. And All right. I wish you fun 
if the in the evening program if you can make it all right thank you thanks a lot